music. We are on the air, guys. Praise God. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? Well, let's yeah. all stand. Amen. We're going to praise God and Periscope and uh, all the all the social medias. Join us. Thank you. Facebook. That's what I was trying to do. Facebook. Yes, Facebook. Hey, 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 oh. Love is Yeah. 
name, O oh Lord. Hallelujah. And we stand upon your word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. You are great, Heavenly Father. You are great and greatly to be praised. 
Oh, hallelujah. Ese ponza karasi. Ese ponza karasi. Yo tata karabasi anza karasi. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, you made this day to rejoice and be glad and thank you for that, Father. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you for our great salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, tata karabasi anza Yo tata karabasi anza Yo tata karabasi. It's a boat, it's a boat, it's a boat, it's a boat tata kai. Yo tata karabasi. It's a ponza karabasi. As a ponza karabasi anza kai. Yo tata karabasi. Oh hallelujah. We worship you, Father. We give you glory today, Father. Oh, we're thankful today, Father. We're so thankful today. Father, we're thankful today. We're thankful today. For you've done so much for us, Father, and you do so much for us. Hallelujah. We're thankful today. Oh, Father, we love you today. We'll worship you, Father, and we thank you for Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, our great Redeemer, our wonderful, wonderful Redeemer, our Lord, our Savior, and our soon-coming King, our very best friend, our covenant head. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, we thank you today. We thank you today, Jesus. We thank you today. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For you ever lived to make intercession for us. Thank you for that, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, tata kadabasi. Ese ponza kadasi. Ese po, you're constantly our advocate at the right hand of the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we have, oh, tata ka, we appreciate it. We worship you and thank you for it, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, this is a great day because it's a day of salvation. This is a great day. Hallelujah. Oh, tata kadabasi. Ese ponza karasi. Ese ponza karasi. Oh, yes, we lift our voice and give you praise. We lift our voice and give you praise. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, tata karabasi. Ese ponza karasi. Ese ponza karasi. Ese ponza karasi. Oh, tata karabasi. Ese ponza karasi. Oh, tata karabasi anza kai. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father. When we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, you are our light. Hallelujah. We just look to the word. You are our light at every end of every, every tunnel. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. You're wonderful, Father. Father, you're wonderful, Jesus. Oh, what a family we live in. What a family to be in the family of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Victory and victory and more victory. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for it, Father. You for it, Father. Oh, we're so thankful. Hallelujah. And we serve you with joyfulness and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Praise the Lord. 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 Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, fill this place with your glory today. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Glory to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, just keep praising God. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Thank you, Jesus.
special in the world, just for them. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Happy uh, Memorial Day. <laughs> Praise God. I forgot to put my microphone on, so it's not on right, and it's kind of bugging me because it's pulling here and pulling there. And Anyway, good to have you with us this morning. I know a lot of people are out of town. I'm glad you guys are here and not somewhere else. Amen? I uh, we, we tend to not go out 
where people gather on holidays like this. Too many people. <laughs> and so uh, we, we uh, stay close to home unless we go somewhere we know there's not going to be a bunch of people. We were, our, our son Michael and I were talking a couple nights ago about the years when we used to go up to Arrowhead Springs, our annual faith advance. I had that set already. Okay. Yeah. And you didn't change it, did you? No. Nope. Okay. So right here at the bottom. Um, we used to go up to Arrowhead Springs, and uh, we'd go up Friday, and we, we would go up early, so we'd get there, like, you know, around lunch or so. Everybody else would be there sometime between then and, you know, 8 o'clock, you know, whatever. We had a Friday night service, and then uh, we'd fellowship afterwards. We didn't go to bed early up there. <laughs> and then Saturday, we had a morning meeting and an evening meeting, and all day was free for activities. And if you know anything about Arrowhead Springs, there's all kinds of stuff to do. And, a couple of pools, uh, big old pool to swim in. Uh, one that they filmed a lot of movies with, um, what's her name? The, Esther Williams, yeah. But, uh, and then tennis courts, basketball courts, things like that. And then we, we started a tradition called Water Wars. <laughs> and after everything was done in the evening, or at night I should say, we all had gotten water guns. And every year they got bigger and better. I ended up with a water cannon with a two gallon tank strapped to my back wearing camouflage <laughs> and we had a ball i mean we just we we just played and uh, god moved during the services and blessed and and then late at night uh, we we chose up teams and it was mostly guys and kids the, the, the women just kind of went to bed i guess you know but we had a good time and i said yeah man i really miss that i wish we had a place to go where we could you know, do stuff like that and get some some concentrated ministry and still have activities where we could get out and do some things. So I'm I'm looking for some place like that. I believe we're going to find it. Amen. 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 We're going to do some special things this morning. By the way, I, I got to thinking back about my family. I don't know of anybody in my family that died uh, in combat. Uh, all my family came home that I'm aware of. You know, now some of my cousins mm -hmm. may be listening and. If they know of anybody, they can let me know. But I'm not aware of any cousins, any uncles, any... No, my, they all came home. But my grandparents were praying grandparents. They knew how to pray. They knew how to believe God. And they prayed protection. Uh, my dad was in Korea. My, uh, my grandfather, I'm not sure where he was. My great-grandfather was in the Civil War. Or my great-great-grandfather, I guess it was, two greats. He was a, a colonel, uh, actually retired a brigadier general uh, in, after the Civil War, but he was in the Civil War, fought at most of the major battles, got shot. Actually, he was the officer, the line officer. That's the guy riding up and down the line shouting orders to the soldiers. He was the line officer on Cemetery Ridge, which was the last battle of the Civil War. And the, uh, he got shot off his horse. And uh, so the... the Soldiers, you know, they saw that, and he's our leader, I mean, you know, and they began to retreat. And, of course, the Confederates started marching up the hill and uh, could have won that battle. But uh, my great-great-grandfather came, too. <laughs> he, he had a habit of dressing out of uniform. By that, I mean he had a uniform on, but he wore this belt that went across his body, a really thick, white belt. And uh, when the bullet hit, it hit that belt. And knocked him off his horse and knocked him unconscious, but it didn't kill him. And so he came to and he saw what was happening. They were about ready to lose that battle. And he looks around for a weapon, and the only thing he could find was a um, bayonet. You know, bayonets then were about, you know, that long. And he grabbed the bayonet, and he stood, and he, he ran up and jumped on the wall. There was a rock wall there. And he yelled, charge. <laughs> and, and they all thought it was a miracle. And so they jumped up and they ran down the hill and drove the Confederates back, and that was the final battle. So, I mean, he, he could have been killed very easily. He had uh, many bullet holes in his uniform. We've heard stories like that before, but he never got shot. Um, so I, I, I can't think in terms of, gee, we lost somebody to war, you know. Um, it prays to have, I praise, it, it prays, it, play, it, it pays, I get it. It pays to have people that know how to pray Amen. praying for you amen? amen amen praise god last night there was a tornado that came uh very close to the tulsa area where our son jonathan lives 
And we had told him, man, you got to take authority over that. And I, when I heard the announcement, I get weather reports uh, for Tulsa. And um, we have a granddaughter back there. And obviously that's, you know, we pray over her. We pray over our son, Jonathan. And um, so we took authority over that command, that thing to skirt around Tulsa and stay out in the countryside. And I, I read this morning, that's exactly what happened. It, it uh, went south and then east and went right around oh. Tulsa. It never went right down through the middle of Tulsa. Yeah. So we, we need to be prayers right. and thank God for the prayers that prayed. I'm sure my grandmother was praying for me. She was a preacher and I'll tell you, she knew how to pray. So anyway, we do honor and we, we uh, uh, you know, we actually hold people up, families and so forth that have lost people in war. Uh, and we honor those that have died in war uh, how, did any of you have any relatives that, that uh, died in war? You do? Yeah. Uh, I have an uncle who was uh, shot down over Italy. Oh, wow. And, uh, his remains are still there. Wow. So he's a pilot, apparently. Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. Well, praise God. Now, see, that's, I mean, out of just this group, one, you know. I really believe that, that when this country has gone to war, even though there have been casualties, Always, if you look at the numbers, our casualties are always less than the others because we're a Christian nation, despite what people have said in the past. We are a Christian nation. We represent what the world looks at as freedom. And, uh, you know, that's what the men and women that are out there, they're fighting for the freedoms that God has given us. And they may not all be born again. They, you know, they may not all know the Lord like we know the Lord, but they're out there fighting for preserving the freedoms that God has given us that we as a nation try to share with other people, other countries. Sometimes it's received, sometimes it's not. But we have sure fought for a lot of other countries, haven't we? Amen. Amen. So anyway, we do respect and, and appreciate those that have uh, been, not, not just those that have died, but even those that have been injured and come back with physical or mental or emotional damage. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to be praying at the end of the service today. Now, don't anybody leave early because you will miss out. I guarantee you. We have something in here very special. What's in this bag? Now, I'm not playing. I'm, I'm, I am serious, even though i got a smile on my face. I'm hiding it from you. What's in this bag is going to be responsible for setting, I believe, thousands of people free. Free. Spiritually, free mentally, free emotionally, free financially. So now you got to stay to find out what's in the bag. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to be praying over what's in that bag. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, just let me give you some quick numbers. Um, the mid last Sunday and this past Wednesday night, we jumped up. We're now in the mid 70s range of viewership, both services. So things are increasing. It seems like every week we get a little bit of an increase. Now, that's the biggest one we get increase we've had. Uh, but obviously people are hungry and they're starting to find out about us and they're tuning in. And eventually that's going to turn into people coming and attending. Amen? Amen? We have averaged on our Google page, we have been averaging 639 views a month since we set it up. So we're up over 2,000 total right now. Praise God. We've had a number of those people that have asked for directions, and we haven't seen them yet, but they're coming. See, asking for directions is the first step. Finding us actually is the first step. Amen? Amen. All right. So we're, we're watching God do things, watching him set it. See, when he spoke to me, when we, when we got in this building, the, and I, I'm thinking as a pastor, what do we need to do? What, what do we need to do to, to bring growth, to bring increase? And, and, and pastors all over the country... Uh, have programs and uh, everyone will tell you well you know we did this program and it worked and it brought in and we did this another church will say well we did this over here and I've, I've discovered over the years that programs are different because the callings of the churches are different the personality of the churches are different what may work for one church may not work for another church and as I was praying at the Lord we're moving into a new building and, and I need to know how can we reach out and what he spoke to me was it's not by might it's not by power, it's by my spirit. What does that mean? Well, it means we got to trust the Holy Spirit to draw the people in and then be obedient to do what he tells us to do. Amen? Amen. And I believe as we do that and are obedient to the Spirit of God, 
he'll take care of the growth. In fact, that's what um, Jack Hayford had spoken to me. He said, don't worry about the numbers. He said, you do your job and God will take care of the numbers. I got something this morning when I was praying. Can I share it? Yeah, sure. Okay, it was about, um, the Lord said, tell me about Mary. whatever it was. Mary. Mary. Oh. He said, tell me about, say, CFC. Tell me about CFC. And I thought, okay. And I was going to say something, and the word came, in, came to me, you're established in faith, and you increase the number daily. So when somebody says, no matter what the situation, tell me about it, instead of going into details about the conditions, the natural conditions, we should be saying what the word says every time to each other. Tell me about CFC. Ask each other if you're married. Tell me about CFC. And they should say, we're established in faith, and we increase the number daily. Tell me about your body. It's healed by the stripes of Jesus all the time. We should be doing that once. So it's a natural thing that just comes out of our mouth. Tell me about, and you put in the answers. But when people say, tell me about your church, you don't have to say, well, it's this many people, or we do this. Say, it's established in faith, and we increase the number daily. And you know, you think, okay, well, we can say that to each other. But if someone in the world says to you, tell me about your church, do you have the boldness to say, we're established in faith, and we increase the number daily? It's time we start speaking this out there to them. Because that only comes back to you and makes you stronger. That means you're not afraid to say it to the world as well as to one another. But we have to begin to start saying, what does the word say about it? Don't say anything else. When someone says, tell me about your husband. He's a disciple, taught of the Lord, obedient to God's will. He's filled with the full, deep, and clear. Well, that's not what I want to hear. Well, that's what you're going to hear. Filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of God's will for him and all spiritual wisdom, comprehensive insight into the... And think about your words. Amen. Tell me what. Tell me about and whatever it is. Give them the word every time, especially at home, one to another. We think at home we can let down the garden, just say it the way the world says it, see it the way the circumstances say it. You can't. Even at home to one another. Tell me about my daughter. Tell me about Jonathan. And, he, and my husband's going to tell me. Or I'll say, tell me about Jonathan. One, two, do you understand what I'm saying? We have to respond even at home the way we would respond here in this church or out there in the world. Amen. Praise God. Amen. That's a good word. Amen. Hallelujah. It ought to become second nature for you to respond like that with what the word says. You can turn these other mics off. With what the word says instead of stopping to think oh gee you know what can i like what can i say about my church you know you tell somebody well you know we got a small church and we only have so many people and we, you know uh, some people get turned off by just the facts it's when they come in and they get the anointing and they hear the word that's going to change them it's not how many people we've got amen it's not how big our building is it's what happens inside this place it's what we do with the kingdom of god amen um i think on the announcements um I've pretty much gone through them. Uh, we, Mary and I got a, a real compliment this week. We were over at the coffee bean, I think it was Friday night, Friday evening, and uh, we're sitting there and, and there's a couple in their 50s that were sitting just behind us and Mary had gone to look at what was in, I don't know, look at something in the store there. And I'm sitting there and, and um, I don't know even how the conversation got started but we got to talking and, and somehow age came up and I made the comment, yeah, my birthday's next week. And they said, well, how old are you gonna be? I said, I'm turning 70. And they said, I mean, literally their mouth dropped open their eyes. Wow, we thought you guys were in your 50s. I said, no, we're, my wife's already in her 70s and I'm getting there real quick. <laughs> and they said, oh, that's amazing. You guys must take good care of your health and yourself. You know. and, they, and I said, well, and I wanted to really minister but I, that didn't come out. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, yeah, you know, they're not ready for that. So you just kind of smile and say, thank you. Well, you know, we eat good, we exercise, we try, you know. But I thought, what a, what a blessing to, you know, to be an older age and have people that look at you and think that you're much younger than you are. But I really believe a part of that is the spiritual youth that we've got. That what they're seeing is not the physical. They're seeing something beyond the physical. We were sitting there one night. Oh, this has been months ago, and uh, somebody said they came over and said, "There's just there's something something about you guys. You just kind of glow, you know." And I'm thinking the glory of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. 
So, you know, you got to realize people watch you. You, you, you. And you don't even have to tell them you're a Christian. They, if, you're, if you're living for the Lord, walking by faith, there is going to be something different about you. They're going to see something different. And, and we get that a lot. And I'm thinking, praise God. I, it, it's, it's good to know that the way you're living is showing something to others without you preaching at it. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. By the way, a little update. I have officially dropped a whole size in my pants and my shirts. I'm now I'm from a 2X, I'm down to a 1X. This is a single X. Not that any of you care, but I, I'm excited about it because my weight's moving in the right direction. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I put a pair of pants on this morning, which I'm not wearing, but they, I haven't worn them for years. And I thought, I'm going to try these on. And I, and I actually got them to button up and everything. And, and they were still a bit snug, but they're another size less than where I'm at now. But, you know, sometimes you just got to determine, I'm going to wear the clothes I want to wear, and I'm going to do what it takes to be able to wear them. Amen. You know what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. All right. Why don't you open your Bibles this morning? Uh, I want to give you a little bit of, you can go to Luke, uh, actually go to James chapter 1, and, and we'll get to that in a few moments. Last week, I began ministering, and, and, and again, I, I never really start out to do a series. I just start out with something that God gave me to minister, and then I realize I'm not getting through it all, and I'm going to continue it the next week. And it becomes a series that way. So this, the title is The Laws of the Tenth and the Seed. And those of you that were here last week, you already have a, a foundation begun in this. Some of you actually had a chance to act on it. Um, but the question that I asked last week is, why don't we have good measure pressed down, shaped together, running over? Why don't we have the windows of heaven open up and blessings being poured out? They say, well, it's by faith. No, no. By faith, you're going to get results. What about manifestation? Why aren't we seeing more people with the windows of heaven opened up in their lives and blessings being poured out if they don't have enough room to receive it all? What about the hundredfold return? That you'll receive back a hundred times as much as was sown. Why aren't we seeing more believers that say they believe the word getting those kind of results? And I got a revelation now. It's been a couple weeks ago. And I saw something I had never seen before. And I mean, it, it was so, such an impactful revelation that I, I broke into tears. I mean, just it was, it was like the Lord was saying, this is what you've been missing. And because uh, you can go out and work. I, I could go out. I could quit what I'm doing now go out and find a job. And I can make money. I know how to make money. But that's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to be here and minister to you. Amen? Amen? So I have to walk by faith for my needs as well. But there's always been something that just didn't quite get there. You know what I mean? It, it's like we're believing God for, for you know, whatever the amount is, and, and maybe three-fourths of it comes in. It's like, Lord, that's not what I'm believing for, you know? And, and for the longest time, I have been. I don't know about anybody else, but I have been frustrated because we have not seen the full manifestation of God's promises when it comes to finances. And when God showed me this, it was the missing, the missing link, it was the missing part of the puzzle, it, it was the missing key. You understand what I'm saying? Thank you, Mary. <laughs> All right, so here's the, one of the problems that we've got to deal with. That is that the kingdom of God operates on spiritual principles or laws. I've had people argue with me about, well, we're not under the law anymore, and as a, as a, a Christian, there are no laws for us. I keep, and I've told every person that ever said that, well, you're wrong. The Bible talks about laws and principles that operate, and, and if we don't operate those laws and principles, then we don't get the results we desire. Amen? Amen. And we'll get into some of that here. When you have a promise from God, well, I don't care whether it's a financial promise, promise of healing, uh, restoration, whatever it might be dealing with, there are always conditions attached. Now, why is that? Is God trying to be hard on us? No. Why are there conditions attached? Anybody got any ideas? What's that? Obedience. Obedience. Okay, anything else? There's laws in effect. There's what? Laws in effect. There's laws in effect. Well, what do the conditions have to do with the spiritual law? Well, 
when you act on the conditions that bring the biblical results, you have now implemented the law of whatever that situation may be. The law of healing, the law of prosperity, the law of forgiveness. Amen? Amen. You, the conditions are not meant to, to make it difficult for us. Remember, in the world, there is the curse. The only way we can walk free from the curse is to implement the laws of the kingdom of God. Hello? Okay, we'll get into what some of those laws are here. All right, so we must apply the principles or the conditions. That's really what it amounts to. James 1.22 tells us to be doers of the word. People, and you and I both know people, say, well, I'm a doer of the word. Then you start talking about things like forgiveness and and offense and, you know, things that deal with emotions a lot of times. And you find out people are holding on to stuff. That, that, that they're not really releasing and letting go. They're letting the devil separate them and, and, and hurt them financially or emotionally or spiritually or whatever it may be that he's attacking. Because the Bible says when the word is sown, Satan comes immediately to try and steal the word. That's what happened to Jesus in the garden. He was attacked. The devil came to... I mean, he was there to seek God in preparation for going to the cross. And the devil came immediately to try and stop him from going to the cross. The, the attack came on account of the word, the promise that we had of the redemption through Jesus. Amen? Amen. So the attack came, and, and Jesus resisted. And what was his response? You know, the only thing he said was, it is written. He quoted the word back to the devil. So then the devil changed subjects and went on to something else. Yeah, Getting back to this... Uh, uh, James 1, 22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves by reasoning, rationalizing contrary to the truth. Jesus was tempted. Does the Bible say he was tempted at all points like we are? Yes. Okay. So if he was tempted, that means he could have yielded. And I know there are people out there, no, he could never have yielded. He was God. No. He, the Bible says in Philippians, he stripped himself of deity and became a man. He stripped himself of deity. He lived in this earth like you and I, which means he was subject to the attacks, the temptations, the things that we're subject to. The difference was he made a choice not to yield to them. So in the garden, he actually prayed, Father, if there's any other way, he knew exactly what he had to do, but he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. He said, nevertheless, not my will, his will at that moment was, I'd like to find another way to accomplish this. People don't, they don't get that. Oh, he's just holy, he's perfect, he never made a mistake. Yeah, but he was human, which means he could have. He could have yielded. If, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He had to be a doer of the word himself. Amen? Amen. So when we're not getting results, the first thing we have to check on is, Am I doing the word? Am I walking in forgiveness? Am I walking in love? Am, am I letting patience have its perfect work? Am I uh, walking by faith? Which means if I'm walking by faith, I'm going to be declaring what I believe. I'm going to speak it out. And Now, the, the, the confession has kind of become a dirty word in church circles because they don't like the word of faith teaching. And they think, you know, that confession stuff, you know, it doesn't work. Well, how about a, a declaration of my faith? You had to get born again that way. You had to confess Jesus as Lord. That was your declaration of his lordship over your life. Amen. So why don't we just follow the example and, and make a declaration of faith. When the opportunity comes to say something, like Pastor Mary said, say what the word says about your situation instead of what the doctor said or what your body says or what your checkbook or bank account says. Amen? Amen. All right. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. I want you all to see this, so you, you know, look it up in your Bible if you got your Bible with you or on your device. And, and remember, no games today, no texting people in church, right? All right, Luke chapter six. I'm going to read from the New International Version. I haven't used that much, but um, I, I, I use. I, I've got four or five different translations that I go back be, between, back and forth. I like the. Uh, Amplified a lot, but I stick with the King James for, for remembering because you, you can memorize it really easy. But 
but then you get like the, the message translation, then you get the, I've got the uh, Young's literal translation, and now the New International Version, and once in a while you see a, another facet of a verse that you never saw before. Amen? All right. So, verse 37 from the New International Version, do not, what's he telling us not to do? Judge. Don't judge. And he says, and you won't be judged. We can't, we, we can't go around judging people. Yeah. We can't go around making the decision whether or, not they're, whether or not they're right or wrong. That's not our business. God's the judge. Amen? Our, our job is to pray for people. If we don't agree with what they're doing, let's pray. Right, let's, let's apply the faith. Like with our kids, you know, their disciples taught them, Lord, obedient to God's will, great is their peace and uncertain composure. Yes. It's, not, it's not based on what I hear or what I see. It's based on what God has said. Amen? My God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not based on what I see. It's based on what God said. Amen? So that, that's what we need to begin to do. When we start judging, we start becoming, we take God's place. All of a sudden we think we've got all the answers and, and we ought to know what's right. And, and you know, anyway. So he said, don't judge. For, the next thing he says is do not condemn and you will not be condemned. He says, forgive. And you will be forgiven. Now, before he says forgive, he says don't judge and don't condemn. Before he gets to the subject of forgiveness. Then he says, now, forgive. Once you quit judging, once you quit condemning, now forgive. What? One of the things that, that we don't seem to get sometimes is that we don't have all the answers as much as we think we do. And, and just because we don't understand something doesn't mean that it's wrong. Or that that person is wrong. Now, before he ever gets to the next subject, which is give, he talks about not judging, he talks about not condemning, he talks about forgiving. Three prerequisites to the next subject, which is giving. Then he says, give and it will be given to you. And this is where the, the, the next part of this comes in. Good measure, pressed down, shake together, running over. <laughs> will be poured into your lap. One translation says into the, the basket uh, or sack that's formed by your robe. They used to pick up a portion of the robe and, and carry stuff like a, like a uh, uh, grocery bag. <laughs> All right. So he said, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, press down, shake together, running over. One other translation says, will men give unto your bosom. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so we've centered up on the, the promises, but we forgot the prerequisites. Hello? We want the promise, but we don't want to go through this other stuff, or we, we rather, rather should be judging ourselves instead of other people. Amen? Don't judge, don't condemn, and forgive. Before, and and it, those are very quick statements. Don't judge, you won't be judged. Don't condemn, you won't be condemned. Forgive, you'll be forgiven. Then he talks about giving, and it'll be given back to you. Then he talks about all the ways it can be given back to you. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Running over. God will cause men to give in your bosom. And I like that last statement. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you again. The way you give when you give also affects the harvest you receive. The way it comes back to you. One translation says if we give grudgingly, it comes back grudgingly. That means, you know, if it's just hard to squeeze a dollar out of you, <laughs> it's going to be hard to get that back. Because you set a spiritual law in motion. Hallelujah. All right. So the conditions were don't judge. We're not called to decide if somebody's right or wrong. Uh, you know, particularly if we have uh, nothing to do with their lives. We're just out there judging. We're not helping. Amen. Leave that to God. James 4.12 says there's only one lawyer and judge and one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? That's pretty direct. <laughs> Amen? Wow, it's quiet in here. No way. <laughs> All right, just wait for that popcorn to start going off. You know? <laughs> I like to eat popcorn. That's what I eat my late night snack is popcorn. And, and I get in there with my my popcorn pot, which Mary always uses to make soup, and I have to sometimes clean it out of the soup, put my popcorn in there, but it's a really good pot. I like it. Um, 
and I, I, I turn it on and I put it on the stove and put the olive oil in there and, and dock the corn kernels in there and then I sit back and wait and wait <laughs> and wait and all of a sudden you hear one pop and then it's my cue to turn the fire down I turn it down to medium and I'd sit and I then it'll start popping popping pop 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 I'm done okay sometimes your response is like that I sit here and wait and wait all right it's okay to say amen but I like the last, the last statement, the phrase he, he says there, who are you to judge your neighbor? So we got to ask ourselves that question, who am I to judge someone else? Now my role as a pastor is a little bit different than your position because I'm called to talk to people about their lives. All right? But you're not. You're called to love and pray. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. So John 8, 15, New International Version. You judge by human standards. Jesus said, I pass judgment on no one. He's not even judging us. The Holy Spirit's not judging you and condemning you. Amen. It's the devil who's the accuser of the brethren. Amen? Amen? All right, so the conditions are don't condemn, don't judge, forgive, and then we get to the giving part and the blessing part. Amen? Amen. Go to Mark chapter 4, verse... Um, We'll start at verse 13. Now this is the second half of the discourse with the disciples on the sower sows the word. First half, I won't take time to read that. We've all read it. He gives the parable. And they didn't get it. All right. So we get now down to verse 13 of Mark chapter 4. Then Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? This one. Do you not understand this one? How then will you understand any? Apparently, this parable is vitally important for us to be able to understand the other parables. Amen. All right. So, <laughs> do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand any? So then he begins to explain it in verse 14. And in the New International Version, it says it this way. The farmer sows the word. What does the farmer sow? The word. The word. The farmer sows the word. Verse 15. Some people are like seed along the path. Now, we talked last week about the path. The path is where people walk. And, and, and the path is always hard because it's packed down. It's compressed. And seeds don't go into the ground on the path. So what happens to the seed? He says here, the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So there's some people, and that's why we get a lot of people that over the years that have come through this church, they came one time. Because their lives were the lives of the path seed. Where they've been, you know, so uh, set in their ways or hard-headed, if you want to use that term. Uh, Closed-minded, not open. They come to check us out instead of coming to hear what God's got to say. So they're, they're like the seed that's been sown in the path. Okay, They heard the word, but as soon as it was given, Satan came immediately to try and take out that word that they heard. Didn't say they didn't hear. It just didn't get in. And how fast does Satan come? Immediately. immediately. One translation says he comes immediately to take away the word, if possibly by force. In other words, he wants to do anything he can to keep the word from working in your life. We're not like every other church in town. I'm not condemning any other church, but we stand upon the word. Everything we do, everything we think, is all based upon the written word of God. It's final authority. Amen? Amen. There's a lot of churches that I talked about, I think it was Wednesday night, on the Bible study, I mentioned about uh, a Baptist church back in Texas uh, they uh, voted, their board voted to allow their ministers to perform gay and lesbian weddings, even though their denomination is against that and believes it's unscriptural and that it's an abomination like the Bible says, they voted to go ahead with it. Well, obviously, they're not reading their Bible or they don't really care what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. But there's a lot of people like that in the body of Christ. They're doing things because it feels right. It feels good. 
you know, and this whole thing about, well, then you don't love people if you don't do what they, it's got nothing to do with the love of God. The love of God, actually, if you, if you get down to it, the love of God is what gives them the truth, even though it's contradictory to what they want to do. That's right. Hallelujah. All right. So, the, then he goes on in verse um, 16. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. Now, here's some that heard it and they got excited about it. We've seen those people come through this church. I say through. Because these people tend to not stay. They receive it with joy, but they have no root. They last for only a short time. Now, even in this time that we've been in this building, we've seen that happen with some people. They have no root. They don't sit long enough to get the teaching that will cause root of the word to grow into their hearts. They hear it on the surface, and it sounds exciting. Oh, we walk by faith. Praise God. We're going to believe God, and we're going to walk in divine health, and we're going to walk in prosperity, and we're going to, you know. And it all sounds really good when you start talking about the promises of God. But they've not taken the time to study and meditate the word for themselves. And I'll tell you what, if you don't study for yourself, all you, that, that root will never really get into you. Oh, you'll agree with it. You'll come to church and say, yes, amen, Pastor, that's good preaching. But then you're struggling because you're not taking the time to do your own study. You're not taking the time to meditate. Take the, the, the word you hear on Sunday mornings and the word that I teach on Wednesdays, and it's only twice a week, and, and take it and study it. Why? So the word can take root in your heart. He said, these people, they heard the word, they received it with joy, they were excited, but since they have no root, they only lasted for a while. When, now listen to this one. See, we missed this. When trouble... Perse or persecution comes because of the what? Words. Why does persecution come? Because Why did trouble come? The it's the devil attacking you, but it's because of the words you're hearing. Don't be surprised when the devil attacks you. Don't be surprised when, when you're tempted to be offended at something. That's the tactic of the devil. He wants you upset. Why? Because then he can divide you. He can stop you. He can take that word out of you that was sown into you. Oh, you know it mentally, but it's not in here. Right? Hello? Okay. So, when trouble and persecution come because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others are like some sown among swords. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in. And choke the word, make it unfruitful. <laughs> the desire for the things, interesting statement to think about. There are a lot of Christians, their first desire is not the word. Their first desire may be to have a great big choir. I want to go to church that's got a big choir. I want to go to church that's got a band. I want to go to church, and they won't say this, but in their minds, there are some people out there that they want to go to a church that's more like a nightclub than a church. Flashing lights, and all the ring lights are off, and they got lights flashing and loud music, and you know. They want something to appeal to their flesh instead of something to appeal to their spirit. Amen? The deceitfulness of wealth, I think a lot of us understand that. Wealth is not deceitful, but there is a deceit that can come along with it if you're not careful. Amen? The love of money is the root of all. You can have money, just don't make it your God. God don't have any problem with us having money. But don't let money have you. <laughs> all right. Uh, the deceitfulness what desires for other things. They choke the word. What do they do? They choke the word, making it unfruitful. In other words, it's not working for them. Why? Because their desires are in the wrong place. Hello? Then in verse 20, others are like seed, so, so, I'll get there. seed sown on good soil. They hear the word, they accept it, and they produce a crop. In other words, they didn't let all this other stuff interfere and pull them away from the message of the word of God. Hallelujah. And it says some produce a crop of 30-fold, some 60, and some 100 well, I don't know about you, but I want the hundredfold return. 
is available, why settle for 30? Why settle for 60? Well, Pastor, all I need is a car that will get me around town. Well, a 1960 Volkswagen will do that, but it's not very comfortable. The heat doesn't work very well. The windshield wipers don't work very well. It doesn't go very fast. <laughs> I know because I had one. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's the 30, 60, 100. I mean, you get 30, you're getting something. You get some kind of return. But that's not God's best. When we have choices that God gives us, always shoot for the best. Amen. I want the hundredfold return. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. But in this parable, and then this is a true parable, I'm telling you, it um, you've got to stop and look at these things and see where you are in this. Because we always think that we're good seed sown into good soil. Well, actually, we're the soil. The seed is the word that we hear. Amen? Our hearts, our, our, our soul, mind, will, emotions. This is the soil. What we are is the soil. Amen? Amen. It's what we do related to that seed that determines our outcome. Hallelujah. I got a testimony this week from one of our partners. We're, getting, we're starting to get a few partners now. Praise God. I'm believing for 100 partners through our social media platform. Got a testimony this week from one of them. Said, Pastor, I listened to your message last Sunday morning. It was so good. It blessed me so much. And I thank you for teaching in such a simple, easy to apply way. Generally, what she said. I thought, Praise God, somebody is hearing something. Amen? Amen. We're not just coming and getting goosebumps and walking out and, and then going about our way and doing whatever we want during the week taking the time to apply what we're learning. We've got to judge ourselves. We've got to come to a place where we look at these on a personal level. Am I allowing, you know, things to, you know, trouble, persecution that come against me because I'm getting the word, the devil's applying pressure? Why am I under this pressure? Because you're going to a word church. <laughs> That's not a confusing thing to come up with. I'm, go I'm going and I'm getting the word and seed planting in my heart. What's the devil want to do? He wants to stop that seed. We want to get to the good part, the, the prosperity part. But you got to understand the principles at work before we can ever arrive because we don't get to the 30, 60, or 100 until we've gone past the other types of soil. What kind of soil are you? Are you the soil on the path where you're hard and compact and set in your ways and you don't want to listen to anything else except what you believe? Are you the seed sown along uh, rocky places where uh, you like the word, you get excited about it when you hear it, but there's no, no root, you don't study it, you don't meditate upon it, so it never gets rooted in you? Hello. Are you the seed sown among thorns? Are you the thorny soil where this, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and desire for other things creep in and choke out that word and you never get results? Or are we the people who receive the word, who take it in, let it get rooted. So you got to backtrack on each of those other types of soil and see what they're missing. Am I going to be the good soil? Am I going to be the one that allows that word to sit long enough to take root before I move on to something else? I've heard people tell me, Mary and I sat at dinner with a couple one night. I used to be involved with us years ago. And... Uh, I talked about, you know, I want to do a meeting in your city. And they said, well, we don't want to hear anything about, you know, faith and, and believing God for things. I thought, well, first of all, who are you? You represent the whole city? Come on. But they got so turned off to the word. And, and now you, and I listen to some of the things that are being said, and I hear compromise. I hear things that are unscriptural. Why? Because they chose to reject something that never really got rooted in them. They never let it get rooted. Other things got in the way. Hallelujah. All right. Let's move on. Going to the next part here. All right. Mark chapter 6. Again. Oh, we weren't at Mark. We were at chapter 4. Mark chapter 6. I'm going to see another revelation here in a minute. Verse 34. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. 
And, and here's what they said. This is a remote place, they said. It's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go get uh, into the surrounding countryside and the villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he, now listen to this. He answered and said, you give them something. What was he doing? He was getting, he, he'd been teaching them. It's time for them to act on it. It's time for them to do something with what they've been hearing. He said, you give them something, which means they would be required to use their faith. If that's going to happen, right? Hello? Okay. So he said, you give them something. They said, now, now I want you to get this. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Now, I want to stop there before we continue. Their mind was in the natural world. They were operating in the world system in their own minds. Oh, we got to go earn this money. They're not even believing that. They're not thinking in terms of anything supernatural. They're thinking in terms of how are we going to pay for this? Where are we going to get enough money? They were operating, and somebody else coined this, not me, but it's, it's scripture. They were operating in the realm of painful toil and sweat. What can I do? What can I afford? He didn't, th he didn't even bring that up. He said, why don't you feed them? Now, Genesis, let's go back. Let's backtrack for a foundation. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Hallelujah. I know it's quicker with your electronic devices to get to that point. Alright, Jen, I used to be able to wait for pages I can hear the pages turning I used to be able to sit and wait for pages to quit turning And then I know everybody found it Now I don't know when you get there uh, I just got to give you a few seconds Hope you find it You know, Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 To Adam he said Because you have listened to your wife And ate the fruit from the tree Which I commanded you You must not eat from it Cursed is He didn't say I'm cursing the ground He said cursed is the ground I, in my notes, those of you, I apologize, I got them out today before the service. I uh, got busy last night and I, I, I just forgot. I apologize. Anyway, I highlighted is. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from the food of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles. And you will eat from the, the plants of the field. Now, if the ground is producing thorns and thistles, their diet must have been terrible at that point. It wasn't producing fruit. Well, what a miserable place. From being in the garden where you had the best of everything to being out into a place where what the ground produces you can't eat. Now you got to work the ground. You got to plant the seed. You got to cause something to grow. You got to water it. It's, it's painful toil. Verse um, 19, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, to dust you are, uh, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So here's this, this idea of painful toil and sweat. In other words, what do I have the ability to produce? Now, there's been, a, there's been times in the last few years that I've gotten under financial pressure and the thought has come to me, well, you know how to make money. Go out and get some business. Go, go find some clients. You know, go, go uh, help them with an estate plan, with, help them with uh, financial services. You, you got all that experience and knowledge. Go, go help somebody, and, and you'll make a good, you know, commission. <laughs> Amen? And I, and I have to say, that business is a very lucrative business. I mean, you can make a lot of money. But God spoke to me about my endeavors in that area and told me that it was not for me to go out and do stuff. If somebody comes to me and wants help, I'm to help them. But not to spend my time going out trying to find clients. So we have knowledge and experience that's available. But I'm not to go out and search for clients. Okay? So I have to deal with that thought. Well, you know, we need some money. We need to pay this or pay that or whatever it may be. Uh, I, I can go out and I can make a few thousand dollars pretty quick. 
you know, it's not hard to do. But the Lord said, that's the painful toil and sweat method. That's, that's based on only what you can do. And, and yeah, God can bless that, but it's still based on what you can do. What Jesus was doing was forcing them to look to a different source. Hallelujah. All right. Matthew 6, 38. How many loaves do you have? Well, first of all, when he, when he asked them, what do you have? Uh, they, they said, we only have um, five loaves and two fishes. So, so that's verse 38 there. So verse 39, then Jesus directed them to uh, have all the people sit down in groups on the ground, on the grass. So they sat down in groups of 50s and 100s. So uh, let me kind of break this down for you. The, the first question is, what's your seed? Which, what do you have for seed? Last week when we talked about it, if you weren't here, you'll have to kind of get caught up. But we talked about uh, seed sowing. And that when we, in fact, let me go back to, I, I changed my diagram a little bit and made it bigger, but it's not perfect because I didn't have a circular template that big. Should have got the biggest giant piece of pie pan. Anyway, this is, this is our sphere of influence. Your family, you, your family, job, finances, healing, so forth, okay? Everything that represents you, everything you have authority over in your sphere of influence is represented by that circle, all right? When you're just living this life, even though you're born again, the devil still has the ability to come in and attack you to a degree. Anybody realize you get attacked by the devil? Okay. And then we begin to tithe and something changes because in Malachi it tells us that when we have the tithe, we now have a, a wall of protection around our sphere of influence. Okay? Now, how... Bring you all the tithe into my storehouse, or baby meet my house. Prove me not by this, so I'll not open the windows of heaven for our blessings to point you one of them from your seed roll. I get it? <laughs> the tithe is the wall around our vineyards, our fields. Then he says, the devil, he didn't use the word term devil, but he will not be able to destroy the fruit of your ground. Wait a minute, the fruit of my ground, that means that there's got to be something in here where I'm planting seed because you can't have fruit of the ground if you don't plant some seed, right? So you got to plant some seed. Just quick, that, that's seed. <laughs> you got to plant some seed because you can't get a harvest if you don't plant seed. What we've missed, and this was a revelation God gave me, is we thought because we're tithers, it's just all going to happen. But we didn't read the part about the fruit of our ground. The fruit of our vines. That means we had to plant something to have fruit of the ground and fruit of the vines. If you don't plant something, you got nothing. What the what the tithe does is it protects what you're out there planting. That's the offerings. That's when we give an offering, it's seed. We plant a seed into the kingdom of God, and now the devil, by because we're tithers, cannot attack and destroy the seed before it produces the harvest. Our vines won't drop their fruit before their time. Hallelujah. Is so you getting that on? Just show that on the camera. You got that? Okay. All right. So the question then, the first question we ask is, what is our seed? What are we going to plant? I'm a tither. That provides protection. But what am I going to plant in order that I have the fruit of the ground and the fruit of the vine? I need to plant some seed somewhere, Right? Okay, so we got to find out what is our seed. Now, and that'll be different for different people. In one case, it was oil. Uh, other, other people had different kinds of seed. In this case, bread and fish, right? What's, what's your seed? Okay, so we got to answer that question. The second thing is, what's the plan? Jesus had him sit down in ranks of 50s and 100s, right? So what's the plan? What, what's God's plan? What is he telling you that you've got to do? There's a part of us doing what the Lord says to do. Now for us, and last week we, we did this, we went through and filled out some envelopes, and I'll just take ours out. Um, and I shared with you last week that we decided that it was time for us to specifically plant seed. And that's what a lot of you came to that same revelation. And so we planted seed for our income. I hadn't been doing that. 
He was going along believing God was plow over needs and, and just income was terrible. Not enough to pay our bills. That I mean, There's been some weeks we couldn't buy groceries. I thought, this is not right. This, this is just plain wrong. And so when I'm, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And, and when I saw this, I thought, oh, man, I haven't been planting seed for my own income. So I figured out how much Mary and I prayed about it, how much we want to get on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, figured out what the seed was for that. Well, what's the seed? If you're going, if you believe on a full return, you just divide that total by 100. That tells you what the seed is. So we figured out what our seed was. And then we, same with the church. We want to believe God for $10,000 a month. I, we weren't planting seed for that. We just assumed God's going to speak to people and the money's going to come in. So what did God deal with us? Let's calculate what the seed is for that $10,000 a month. And so we did. And uh, we, we wrote that down. It's $100 a month. What's 100 times uh, uh, 100? 10,000. Okay. So we're planning this week. We got, Mary got on the phone and called Kenneth Copeland Ministries and who else? Uh, Feed the Hungry and Keith Moore, three ministries, and Bill Winston, four ministries. So we got on the phone this week. We called four different ministries. We took our seed. Now, we included some seed. Obviously, I mentioned my truck. Got, planted a seed for my truck. The Sacramento trip, we figured about $1,500 cost for the trip going up to Brother Copeland's meeting. And... Uh, you know, we need to believe God for that, so we planted a seed for that. We named our seed. Um, we planted a seed for our new home. I ain't going to tell you what that is. <laughs> but we planted a seed for the things that we want. And this is what we've been missing, and we didn't realize we were missing it. But our hearts were open. We wanted to know, God, something isn't working. What, what is my part? What is the plan here? And, and it became very simple once I saw it. The plan is... Plant something in your fields. Don't leave your fields empty. So we planted our seed. Sometimes we've got to stop looking at all what we can do, or that we can do, and look at the spiritual side. Do I need to plant a seed? If you're believing God for something that costs money, then chances are you probably need to plant a seed for that. I don't care if you believe in God for a puppy dog. <laughs> You know, puppy dogs are expensive nowadays, you know that? But you know what? Why not believe God? Why not get God involved with your faith project? Amen? Plant a seed. Let God get involved with that seed. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we've decided to do. Now, we've been givers for years. We've supported Brother Copeland's ministry, and, and he's up Jerry Savelle's ministry. But we never thought in terms of that's a seed for this Results for this harvest. We just thought in terms I'm planting seed. But you gotta you gotta and this is what the Lord's supposed to us, you gotta name your seed. You gotta determine what that seed harvest will be. So I planted I, I and I said last week we didn't have the ten percent of a forty five thousand dollar truck to plant. We didn't have forty five hundred dollars. In fact we didn't even have forty five dollars, but we had four dollars and fifty cents. And you do know farmers plant seed for more seed, right? They, they want more seed, they plant seed. When most farmers divide their crops three ways, they, they take out the seed part for planting and more seed. They ta take out the part that is to be given or sown somewhere else. And then they take out the last part, which is usually not the best part for their eating. They want to plant the, they, they want the good stuff to be planted, amen? So. We just were missing that one little element about planting a seed for a specific result. So with my truck situation, I thought, well, I can, we, we've got $4.50. I'm going to plant a $4.50 seed. What's 100 times $4.50? $4.50 times 100. 450 right? Yes? Okay. Just make sure. I sound like I was hearing other things. Okay. So, this and, and, and listen to this. What, what we have to be watchful is when that harvest comes to recognize it as the harvest of that seed. When I get a check or I get an income, a, a fixed amount of $450, I know that's the result of the seed I planted. And with that now, it's more seed than I plant that for the truck itself. See, sometimes we don't have the seed 
to match the harvest. We'll plant seed that will get you there. Amen. All right. So we've got to find out what God's plan is, how we get there. And then, now here's the important part. Verse 41. What did Jesus do? He told the disciples, well, he took the five loaves, he took the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And what did he do? He prayed over the seed, right? What he did literally was, by praying over it, he took the natural and brought it into the supernatural. He transferred the seed into the kingdom of God through his prayer. He allowed God to get a hold of it. Sometimes we don't do that. We just give, and we don't, we don't really pray over it. Oh, pastor, you know, he's believing God for this or for that. I'm going to sow a seed for that. And we don't, we don't really believe God for the harvest. Want to help out. But why not plant the seed for a harvest? Name the seed. Amen? Yeah. Transfer it. When we, that's why I tell you, when we receive our tithes and offerings, we, you need to pray when I'm praying over your, your giving. Because that's what transfers that physical money into a spiritual gift that Jesus worshiped the Father with. You understand that? We have to bring our seed, our money, into the kingdom of God. The kingdom laws, the kingdom... That's why we call this the, the law of the tenth and the seed. Because there's spiritual laws that apply to the tithe, and there's spiritual laws that apply to the seed. If I, if I believe God and we give our tithe, we know we've got a, a supernatural protection for our sphere of influence, our family, our life, right? But if I, if I don't plant seeds, I got no harvest. The devil can't attack anything that's not there anyway. But when, when I am planting seed, the tithe makes sure that the devil can't get in there and steal my seed. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something else that happens. Uh, sometimes we... We uh, have a little cheap, you know, little open space. You think the devil will take advantage of that? Oh, yeah. Sometimes we uh, open the door and the devil comes in. Right? You understand that? That's an open door. <laughs> All right. So what is that? What, what are the open doors? Well, obviously sin is one. Right? No Strife is one. Offense is one. Unbelief is one. Disobedience to God is one. You understand what I'm talking about? Anytime we get caught up in those areas, we're opening the door. And what's the devil going to do? He's going to come in. He's going to start attacking all this that you've been planting and all this you're responsible for. So what do we have to do? If we catch ourselves in one of these areas, we have to repent. Right? And when we repent, where's my marker? <laughs> what do we do? We close that door again, right? We repent. What do we do? We close the door. The devil can't get back in. That's that shield uh, that the tide provides is up there working for us. Amen. Amen. You getting something out of this? Amen. How much time I got left? Fifty minutes. Fifty? No, no, no. Fifteen? No. Wait, I'm sorry. Thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Twelve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. We have to transfer our giving into the kingdom of God so that God can put the super on our natural. Amen. Got that? All right. We bring, this, we bring our seed under kingdom laws. All right. So then it says, he gave, to them, he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. So what happened was once the natural, the bread and the fish, were brought into the kingdom or kingdom authority, by the prayer he prayed, he could then give it back to them and made the disciples responsible for handing it out. Now, don't you know that some of those disciples thought in their minds, hey, no way this is going to go far enough to feed this first group I got here. And he just keeps breaking, and he's thinking, oh, well, maybe I can get 50. You know, maybe I can feed, okay. He gets done, and, and he's got more than he started with. He goes to the next group, and it's 100 people. He says, well, there may be a I don't know, it didn't look like it was enough for 100 people, but let's start feeding. And he starts handing out bread, handing out fish. He gets to the end of the 100, and there's more. It's multiplying. <laughs> they get to the end. What happens when they get to the end? 
they fed 5,000 men. It doesn't count the women and children. So we don't know how many there were. But 5,000 is a bunch. You ever tried to feed 5,000 with a couple of fish and a couple of loaves and pot loaves of bread? Somebody said, I heard some preacher say, when I, they were huge, giant loaves. Baloney. They were just regular food. In one case, it says that, that uh, one guy brought one loaf of bread along for his lunch, and they, they divided that up, and it fed thousands. Right? All right. But look what happened. In verse um, 42, it says, they all ate and were satisfied. Now, you know there's some big guys in there that had to have more than one helping. Right? So, so you've got 5,000 minimum meals, plus a few seconds and thirds, plus the women and the children. Could have been fifteen or 20,000 meals that were served with five loaves and two fish. Verse 43, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. They picked up more when they were done. They had five loaves and two fish. Now they got 12 baskets. By the way, there's another principle involved with this. I'll just call it the principle of the fragments. Don't take anything for granted. It, little things add up. Amen? That just like this benefit last year, I think it was, I, I shared with you about uh, getting signed up for benefit, and, and, and you can put uh, money that you're already paying the store, part of that the store will get back into the ministry. And I'm not going to even ask how many people signed up for it, but I've watched what we've done, and we've been faithful. Every time we go to buy some, we check on the benefit app and see if the store we're at is in there, and if so, then we go over to Ebates, we double it. <laughs> we go over to Ebates and see if it's on their list. If it is, we go ahead and buy through Ebates, but get the virtual gift card through Benefit to pay for it, and we get double the discount or the rebates. Now that sounds like such a little thing. Sometimes it's only a few cents. Sometimes it's a dollar, sometimes two dollars. But we have literally just us in the last, well, I, I don't know exactly how long it's been now. It's been over a year. We have put in, last time I saw, and I have to, I, I don't know the exact number, last time I saw it was $200 just by doing that. But especially great during Christmas time because you're going to buy stuff anyway, you know. But we buy food every week. We buy stuff every month, amen? Little things. We found a program, uh, it's an app online. I share this with you to show you how the fragments can work. We found a program uh, called Acorn. Or acorns, plural, A-C-O-R-N-S. And the, their symbol, their icon is a little acorn. And I signed up for that. And what they do is they take the, the like when you go shopping and your bill is $37.85, right? They round it up to the next dollar. And they pull 15 cents out and put it in your account. If it's $25.15, they take the difference of the next dollar. And they put that in your account. So what's happening is every time we spend money without even feeling it, a few cents, not a lot, it goes into our account. And what do they do? They then invest that into something that's a safe investment that we're getting growth on. Hallelujah. It's working for us, so we're not doing a thing. So when he talked about, the, the, the in fact, later on, I think it's chapter 8, he, he says, don't you remember what happened when we fed the 5,000 and, the, and then I think it was 7,000. Don't you remember what happened? How many, how many baskets full were left when we were done feeding everybody? And then in this, this case, they said 12 baskets full. Don't you get it? When you bring your seed under kingdom laws, those kingdom laws begin to apply specifically to that seed to multiply it. So not only did it multiply enough to feed everybody, it also made provision so they had bread and food for a while, bread and fish for a while. Amen. They might have got tired of bread and fish. They had so much of it. They might have been able to sell some of that bread and fish. They might have gone into business. You, I mean, that's what got, I mean, look at the fish. They went out there and they, uh, they fished all night and didn't get anything. Jesus said, throw your net over here on this other side, and they throw it in. And they get a, a load of fish that's so big it's breaking the nets and it took two boats to get it in. Well, you don't think they ate all that fish in one night, do you? I believe that these guys were fishermen. They went to the fish market and they sold fish. 
Hallelujah. See, God wants to do for us more than we're even believing Him for. Amen. We give and we don't even look at the harvest. Some people have this false humility. Well, I don't want it. I just give. And, well, that's that. You're, you're cutting God's blessing. Remember, He told Israel, "You're robbing me." And they said, "How have we robbed you?" He said, "You withheld tithes and offerings." He was. They weren't stealing from God in the sense of stealing His money. What was what they were robbing God of was the pleasure of a father to bless his children. And unless they act on the principle, you remember that there is where, where is the curse? The curse is all around us, right? The curse is in the world because of Adam. What does it take to operate out from under the curse? It takes operating on kingdom principles. The only way we escape what's in the world as a curse is when we do what God says to do, which are kingdom principles, which supersede the natural realm that we're living in. That's why our tithe is so important. That's why our offerings, are, our seeds are so important. Because that causes us to go beyond the limitations of the natural realm. We don't have to live by toil and, and sweat and tears. We can live by faith and watch God multiply our efforts. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. So, uh, now let's read uh, Mark chapter 8. How much time I got? Five minutes. Really? Okay. Mark chapter 8, verse 13. I'm going to read fast. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. And the disciples brought, uh, uh, had forgotten bread, except for... Now, you got to remember, they've already seen the multiplication, haven't they? All right? So they forgot to bring bread, and they brought one loaf. Jesus, verse 15, says, be careful. He's, he warned, he said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, or the leaven of the Pharisees, and that of Herod. And they discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. And he wasn't even talking about that. He was talking about the effect of religion upon them. Amen? Verse 17, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not see or understand? Are your hearts so hardened? They had watched the miracles of multiplication. And they didn't get the principles. Do you have eyes but fail to see? Verse 18, and ears but fail to hear. And don't you remember, verse 19, when I broke the five loaves and, uh, and fed the 5,000, and how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? They said 12. And when I broke the seven loaves and 4,000, uh, how many baskets uh, did you pick up? They said seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? <laughs> what, what was it they were failing to get? They had to take, first they had to determine what their seed was. They had to get God's plan on how to apply or how, what to do. Just like we had to do with our own, with our own uh, seed. We had to get God's plan. I sat down after I prayed about it and I wrote it out on a piece of paper. I wrote down our, what we're believing for. And I, I calculated and figured out what we need to plant as a seed to get to that point of being able to afford those things. you got to have your plan in place. Amen? Amen. All right. So he said, you got to remember. And then you've got to bring it into the kingdom. You got to bring it under kingdom laws. How? By giving it to God in faith. You pray over it. You bless it. You bless the Father. You sow it as seed into the kingdom. Amen. This is what it, they were doing here. They were feeding thousands of people. What a blessing that was. It'd be fun to be able to feed thousands of people every week. I mean, if you can do it with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, I'm, I'm sure he can work it out for us to figure out a way to do it. Amen. All right, so I have five things. I've said it a number of times. I'm trying to say it enough to get in your thinking where you don't forget it. They have to. They had to figure out their seed. They identified their seed, loaves and fish in their case, right? They had to have God's plan. They had to find out what to do with it. He told them what to do. Set them down in ranks, fifties and hundreds, organization. By the way, God is organized. Amen. It's not just indiscriminate. Praise God. All right. Then the seed must be brought under the kingdom principles, transferred into the kingdom by the act of giving and prayer. So you, your giving act and your prayer over that giving transfers it into the kingdom. And of course, there had to be an action of faith. And what was that? The disciples had to pass it out. Even though it looked like it would never feed that many, they kept breaking and passing as long as they had it. They kept breaking and passing it. Uh, and the fifth thing is, 
They had to gather up the fragments because God's not a wasteful God. He didn't want that food to rot since it was multiplied supernaturally. There was a purpose behind it. There's always a purpose behind the fragments. And so in, in this case, I'm sure we can look at ongoing provision and more seed for other things. Hallelujah. I want to, I know I'm just about out of time now. Let me give you a short story. By the way, you might not like stories, but we learn by stories. Experiences, things we've seen, read, heard, something God did for me, something God did for somebody else. These are things that will help us to learn principles. Anybody remember the name Jim Spillman? Okay, Jim Spillman was, was a preacher. I mean, last time I heard him was a long time ago. Um, Jim Spillman came to, we were at a meeting. It was uh, Kenneth Copeland, Jim Spillman, <coughs> and Mary. The third one. No, at the faith of at the, at the thing. Remember, there were three speakers. Jim Spillman, Kenneth Copeland, and yeah, you do. We had him at our church. He oh, choked. Dick Mills. Dick Mills. There we go. Dick Mills. I saved Dick Mills' life. Anybody know Dick Mills? Yeah. I, I saved his life. He, we were in a restaurant having lunch. He started choking. Couldn't breathe. And I got there and I gave him the Heimlich maneuver and I said, in the name of Jesus, come out. And he spit it out. <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, Jim Spillman shares the story of his son who took a bunch of youth up to a, a camp in the mountains and they had you know, brought, they were gonna, they were gonna cook a meal, and they were gonna invite people from the campground into their camp, and then witness to them. So they get there, and they, they get the meal all cooked up, and then they realize they don't have enough. And and they said, well, you know, let's invite the people in, and the people started coming in from all over the campground. They were surprised, and they, and, and again, they looked at the pot, and there there wasn't enough spaghetti. They're gonna serve spaghetti, and there wasn't enough rolls. And the guys looked at him and said, what do we do? He said, well, I remember in the Bible that they prayed over food and it was multiplied. He says, let's pray over this food and expect God to multiply. They stuck their hands in the spaghetti. They took things very literal. <laughs> they stuck their hands in the spaghetti and prayed over it. It didn't look any different. The rolls didn't look any different. But they started serving people and exactly what we see in the Bible took place. They got done serving, and I forget what the number was now, way more than they had supply for and the pot was still full and there were still rolls they couldn't figure it out of course he, he explained to them what happened he said they did that three days in a row they finally got so sick of spaghetti they had to dump it out because <laughs> it just wouldn't go away <coughs> I suspect God had a bigger plan I suspect that there was more available that they didn't tap into God doesn't bless you with abundance just so you can have abundance. That's right. God blesses you so you can do something with that abundance. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. I know I'm out of time, and I'm going to have to stop. I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to get into the original curse, why we have to get involved with all. I've shared a little bit. I've touched on a little bit. I guess we'll have to go another session to finish this off. Uh, but that's all right. We will. Praise God. All right. So. What has to happen in our field? You have to sow. Wait, what? You have to sow seed. You got to sow seed. Otherwise, you got empty fields. The tithe is meant to keep the devil from attacking your fruit of the ground and the fruit of your vines. But if you don't plant seed, you got nothing. Hello? Amen. Now, last week, we had people, uh, you know, I mean, you just got to do what you feel impressed to do. But uh, we had people fill out an envelope put on there. Now, I've, I've copied this for us to pray so we can keep track. Uh, so I'm going to hand these back out. Um, Aisha? This is for you. You keep these envelopes and you write down when the harvest comes. Keep track. This will be a testimony for you. Now, I have seed for somebody who wanted their house remodeled. Who did that? Willie. All right. So, there you go. So you hold on to that. Maggie. Where's Maggie? Maggie. Where's Jose and Maggie? Where's Jose and Maggie? They're not here. Give this to your mother. All right. All right. We're doing things something a little bit different. Now, somebody is believing for a nice car, apparently, but didn't put their name on there. Okay. So.
do me a favor so I can pray for you. Make sure you put your names on things. Oh, you recognize my script. No, actually, I didn't. <laughs> uh, Legina, here you go. All right. We have prayed and we pray, continue to pray. Who's believing for a holiday home? Uh -huh. All right. So, all right, now we got that all sorted out. And then somebody filled out an envelope for seed and something for us, but there was nothing in it and no name on the envelope. Who was that? Nice thought. Well, somebody somebody wrote it. I, I don't recognize the handwriting again. I, you used you used the regular ties and offering envelope. Who was that? Nobody wants to own up to it. I'm gonna put it over here. I'd like to see that. <laughs> anyway, all right. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna receive our ties and offerings, but we're not done because I want to I want to do something special here. We're gonna receive our ties and offerings. Now here's what we need to do. Those of you that Today, you, you recognize, I need to sow some seed. I need to be specific. I need to get something planted in my vineyard. If I don't plant the seed, I'll never get a harvest, right? So if that is you, when you get your envelope today, I want you to put on there, there's a place for your tithe, there's a place for your offering, then there's a place for other. Now, on other, you can just cross that out and put seed, so we know that's specific. Because we want to keep these and pray with you and agree with you, until it comes in. Pastor Bill, isn't the seed the offering? That's the offering beyond your tithe, right? No, isn't the seed the offering? There's three things. Offerings are, are seed. Okay. Yeah. It's tithes and offerings. That's where God said they were robbing him. Israel was robbing him. Uh, tithes and offerings. So we're, I'm using the term seed for the illustration purposes. So when you put, you, yeah, you can put offering up here, but if you're talking about your regular support of the ministry, that's not special seed. You understand? That's support of the ministry. Right. If you've got a seed for a specific thing beyond that, then I would use the other category there and, and put it there. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to pray over this. And I want you to pray. While I'm praying, I want you to pray. I want you to take your seed, your tithe, your offering, and I want you to give it to the Lord with your faith. And we'll agree with you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Father, you have given us a revelation. You've opened up a, a treasure chest, so to speak, to us. You've given us the, I, the understanding of how these principles work, and we appreciate it. And Father, we bring our tithe into this storehouse. We thank you for the protection that, that comes from the tithe. And we know, Father, where that goes into the work of the kingdom. And Father, we give it freely. We also bring our offerings for the support of this ministry. But, Father, we also want to sow a seed toward a specific project. And, Father, I agree with every person here that as those that have already sown seeds, Father, we agree with them for the specific harvest they declared. For those that are going to sow that special seed today, we set ourselves in agreement with them for their harvest. And, Father, we thank you that as we have gotten this revelation, it won't be a quick thing that we just forget about down the road. But Father, we will set this as part of our lifestyle. That we will dedicate our tithe and we will dedicate the seed offering as we plant our seed that we will determine, that, name that seed and determine the outcome, the harvest. Father, I agree with every person here. As they've been a part of this ministry and sown and given into this ministry, Father, it's going to come back because this ministry is good soil. And it's going to come back multiplied. It's going to come back quick. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you need an envelope, uh, raise your hand and, and Jeff will hand you an envelope.
Yes. Where is it? You say you got tied of where's the other? Okay, where it says other, just cross oh. out and put C. And then fill in the other. Y'all got that, right? Where it says other, you can cross that out and write C until we identify that. Put the C amount in there. So again, this is beyond your normal tithes and offerings. This is a special thing for a special harvest. I'm gonna give jo I'm gonna give Daryl away. Plant him somewhere else. <laughs> We've gone for a harvest. <laughs> oh, he's the only one I've got right now. Well, I take that back. We got a couple more. Praise God. We've been doing that. All of you on Facebook and Periscope and and uh, YouTube and Twitter. We're glad you guys joined us today. I believe that you heard something that will help you. If you've not been operating the seat giving or the offerings this way, it's time to be specific about it. Go back and listen to the message a number of times until it sinks in and you actually you get that revelation. That's what happened to us. We got that revelation. You got to get that revelation. And then begin to act on it. You sow your seed and, and as you do, name name that seed. What's it represent? You believe in God for a new home? Name it. Plant that seed and call it. This is my seed for my new home. If you believe in God for a new car, this is my seed for my new car. And be specific, not just a car. Be specific. Know what you want. If you believe in God for uh, something else, be specific about it. God's specific and the principles are specific. So name the seed. Be specific about what, it's, what the harvest is. Amen? If you want to partner with us, if you haven't done that yet, we welcome you. We pray every day for our partners. Believe God with you. we got special things that we're, we'll be doing for our partners over time. So we'd love to have you if you want to commit and be faithful and support us on a monthly basis. And it'll help us to do the work that God's given us to do. So we bless you guys. And we will see you all, by the way, Wednesday night, 6 o'clock California time, Bible study. See you next week.